Welcome back, everyone. Is everyone here? Because you really don't want to miss what's going to happen next. In his home country of Cuba, San Miguel Perez is also known as El Tresero Moderno, the modern Tresero. An exceptional musician, he is considered one of the best guitar players in Cuba and has been awarded with two Cubasico Awards for Best Tracero and Best Cuban Traditional Music. He is also a singer, percussionist, composer, and he is highly respected for his knowledge of Cuban music. San Miguel believes that what connects culture, even though there might be political differences, is the culture of music and the healing effect, and ha that ha the feel healing effect that music has on people all over the world. And over the last 20 years, Cecilia Noel has come to realize more and more that the power of music is a very strong connector between pe people and cultures. Originally from Lima, Peru, Cecilia's career began at the age of eight with a starring role in a Peruvian television show called El Tion Johnny. Since being discovered in Peru by Stan Getz, Noel has become a favorite of Latin music aficionados in the know I give you San Miguel Perez and Cecilia Noel. Thank you, lovely audience of all nations. It is an honor and a privilege to be in the presence of our wonderful president, Jimmy Carter, his lovely First Lady, Rosalind Carter, and this amazing, tireless audience. Thank you to the Carter Center for bringing us here and letting us be part of this magnificent forum. We are musicians bringing a message of love and peace and unity. And on our second song, Un Poquito de Amor Every Day, you have your lyrics there, and we would love for you guys to join us. Please put your hands together for the one and only from Cuba, San Miguel. Thank you. Por 
Siempre por todas mis venas Siempre por todas mis venas Por todas mis
fun. We need a little enjoyment and beauty in this discussion because this is so difficult, the things we're talking about, and we always have to bring joy and beauty into everything we do to keep our spirits happy. Yes. yes. Um, and now I'm going to ask um, a dear friend, Melissa Hooper, who's been so helpful along with Brian, who you saw earlier in putting this forum together, um, to lead us in our next conversation about the very difficult conditions that we are all facing. So I'm going to ask Melissa to lead us along the way. Great. Thank you so much, Karen. Um, and we are, I think, all very grateful to President Carter and the Carter Center for bringing us together um, to have this discussion. And I think um, a colleague of mine said it earlier, particularly at this time uh, where we do see very difficult conditions in so many countries um, and a real shift in many countries in recent years um, in, in the way standards are thought about, in the way human rights standards are thought about, which is worsening conditions. But um, at the same time, we also see in ourselves a shift and we are beginning to uh, to take up the struggle in dealing with these changing conditions. And so we're starting to see where there might be hope. And I think that um, this has been an important time for us to come together and consider that. Um, this is the discussion of the new normal. Um, and uh, this is the session where we talk about the, the struggle that we're in right now, provide a snapshot of where we are. Um, and so we can look toward where we're going. Um, and uh, I want to point out that part of the, the difficulty of this struggle is that we are seeing leaders take the standards, take the language that we use, the language of human rights, and try to hollow it out and try to uh, say that corruption is part of the fabric of our society, try to say that human rights means that certain rights uh, are privileged over other rights. Um, but that we are taking back that language and we are taking back that struggle. And um, I, I want to um, ask our, uh, some of our speakers to discuss what's been happening in their countries and the difficult conditions they're dealing with, but also um, to hopefully not leave out if there are rays of hope and where they see um, rays of hope coming in. So I think we will begin um, with the discussion of Kenya. Jadida Waru Hugh, please, um, if you could start us off. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Your Excellency and uh, family and all my colleagues here. It's a pl privilege and a pleasure to be here. Um, we, we started off uh, this afternoon with the Lord's Prayer. I'll, I'll start with a quotation from Hosea 4.6, which says that by people, are destroyed for lack of knowledge. When I was born, I looked up to my mother uh, for nourishment and for warmth. When I learned how to speak, I looked up to my father and mother for guidance and love. When I learned how to go to school, I looked up to my teachers to teach me how to read, write, and enjoy other children's uh, company. When I passed my primary school exams, I began looking up to my teachers more to guide me and expand my horizons of knowledge and perspectives. When I went to university, I looked up to my professors to expand my critical thinking and my public service notions. I began getting, into, getting more involved with the activities and the issues beyond my small community and village. I began looking at my country critically and around the world. I began looking at it analytically, 
for more knowledge and guidance, including good examples and best practices. I also began to look a bit more closer and to learn more from my elders and also my default mentors, some of whom were seated here today. Indeed, my first human rights lessons, I learned them at home. I learned that we are all equal, yet gifted differently. I learned that to do the right things, to do the right things, and I also learned to tell the truth always. When I went to university to study law, my professors uh, guided me on the principles of law, and they taught me the importance of the Constitution. And I recognize that my own people in my own community, in my country, then had very little understanding or knowledge that we indeed even had a constitution in Kenya. That was despite the freedom struggles for freedom and land. During that time at the university, I volunteered in one of the first uh, NGOs known as Kituo Chasharia to give legal advice from village to village, from college to college, so that I could be able to contribute to build their awareness and teach them about the importance of power and the power in the Constitution. I later on joined a law firm, which I left after a little short while. Actually, I left a career of looking like a smart lawyer and joined the NGO fraternity, which was really much unknown then in, in the 90s. It really more was seen as a class suicide in my career path. My first stop was in one of the most controversial pressure groups, which was known as the Release Political Prisoners Pressure Group, which during that time was agitating for the release of all political prisoners. I served and learned more about human rights from there. Indeed, a very critical partnership with Amnesty International, which at that time was very instrumental in putting pressure on the then dictatorial government. Fortunately, many political prisoners of conscience were released due to the local and international pressure. And we even moved to be a multi-party state. And you heard this yesterday when Maina Kei spoke about it in our small group. And many prisoners of conscience were released. Unfortunately, that did not stop the brutalization of uh, people of conscience. And they continued to be brutalized. And we moved again to the second liberation. To tell you the truth, I learned my human rights while defending other people's human rights in the streets, in the community dialogues, and in the courts. The closest I actually came to a class called Human Rights Law was when I did my master's in the United Kingdom. You may be seated there and asking, what is my point? Why am I telling you stories of old? My point is, is that my point of view expanded through the world's viewpoint. I learned and I was taught to look at best practices and more so to look at best practices from the West and among the community of nations. I learned to look at the regional and international law and the practices that I could benchmark with as a country. Thank you. I'm not yet done yet. <laughs> Therefore, this brings me to my current dilemma and challenge. First, I want to look at one of the places we looked for good practices, which was uh, the US, which we looked at as a democracy, at least as a working democracy where the rule of law counted, where the Fifth Amendment was respected. But after 9-11, after the Patriotic uh, Act, after Guantanamo Bay, after police brutalizing the DACA community. My government has learned and, and has learned and turned this to be our other democracy. Kenya and the US are very similar, especially in respect to issues of where legislation is there and available and where there are accountability institutions. We probably in Kenya have the best constitution in the world. We do have indeed a robust legal process. However, as I sit at the Kenya National Commission on Human Rights, when we say no to counter-terror strategy that does not respect the rule of law, 
that does not respect natural justice, that does not respect human rights. Our fingers are slowly pointed to the US and to other countries that tackle extreme, uh, that tackle terror. And we are, when we are informed that these are states that have major resources and years of history of doing with these things. So who are we in Kenya to, to, to do things differently? Anyway, we are informed that in Kenya, we, we do receive military training. And for us, on this other end, we actually receive funding from them. Our challenge in countering uh, terror extremism in Kenya, unfortunately, has led to us being more violent and has only bled more resentment and more violence. Communities, especially allow, around the coastal areas in the northern region, live in constant fear from not only the police but also the military. I don't think this is new for many. The potential, the, the potential to this, the, the impact of this is that arbitrary arrests have become the norm. People being detained in the name of national security is uh, apparent. People are made to disappear. We've actually made the word disappear to be a verb because they disappeared or executed. Therefore, the right to life has really become a scarce reality, especially to the youth, males, and to the Muslim community. We are constantly living in fear for our lives. Just yesterday, as I was looking at Twitter, I saw that a second year old, a second year Kenyatta University student known as Ahmed Haj Malim Abdullahi disappeared in Mandera County. That's in the north of Kenya. What really is happening to us? That's my first dilemma. The second point I want to make is what recently happened in Europe and later bounced back here in the US. This is the issue of the influx of refugees, especially from Syria and other countries, from the countries that were, con were in conflict and flooded the, the, the states of Europe, where I was taught when I was doing my master's degree that uh, the refugee policy there was very advanced and looked good. And indeed I believed it because in the 1970s, 80s, 90s, many political dissidents from Kenya and people who had fled politically motivated violence and were victims sought refuge and actually got granted asylum in those places and were educated in those states. However, the closure of boundaries, the fear of refugee influx was apparent to me. And I thought about Africa. And I thought about our prima facie principle, which is under the OAU Convention for Refugees. And I, appreciate it, and I did appreciate Africa for that. Indeed, in Kenya, we've received many refugees on the prima facie principle. The Rwandese, Burundians, Congolese, Sudanese, Somalis have come in their numbers in Kenya. We even built two camps, specifically one called Kakuma for the Great Lakes region, and the other called Dadab for the Somali community, so that we could be able to house them. However, last year, and now we have learned, and we've learned very quickly, that we don't have to open our borders. We don't have to serve the, the vulnerable without complaining. We have learned that we can actually shut them in the name of security. After all, those who are endowed with many more resources in the international sphere are doing it without condemnation. Why us, a developing nation? At the National Commission, we were still convicted by the constitutional principles and the, princip and the principle of non reform law. And we went to the High Court and sought we sought the High Court as a last intervention to say no to human rights violations of the Somali community. Fortunately, the High Court agreed with us and said, yes, we cannot force people to repatriate and we cannot close the Somali refugee camp. However, I'm not sure how long this will last because the decision has been contested by the state. My dilemma is, and if you speak to people in the streets generally in Kenya, is how 
If you ask them how is the state handling security and refugees, they'll say it is okay, they're doing well, but these human rights people are making it difficult for the government. How can you defend the rights of criminals, meaning terrorists, meaning the victims? How are victims going to stay safe? For them, it's security at all costs. What do you say to such a person, especially a, a victim of terror? What examples are out there to guide them, to show them that you can protect, you can have national security, and also respect human rights and freedoms in the same breath? It is even becoming more difficult for us. And I believe this is a reality that then we must wake up to, a reality that we have to look for guidance and political advocacy elsewhere because when you look around, these examples continue to be part of the weaponization of fear. It means we have to create new alliances amongst ourselves and it also means that we must build our capacities in a more significant way even where we don't feel that we have the capacity. We must do differently and we must continue to make a difference. It means that, yes, uh, I'm just finishing. It also means that for us, we must uh, learn, we must learn to do things differently and renew our struggles together because together we will then be able to work and make a difference to each other by learning from what happens amongst ourselves and not only looking at those out there that we say are doing better than us or had better examples. Because if we do that, then we will be failing. But we must continue speaking truth to power. We must continue sp speaking powerfully. We must do this with wisdom and with courage. We must continue speaking our truth and stay the true course of our, of our struggle. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tadida, and thank you for, um, for also urging us to continue and, um, and move forward. Um, I, we have, there is so much going on and we would like to hear from everyone, so we're trying to limit interventions to five to maybe at the most seven minutes. Um, thank you very much. Uh, so uh, next we would, we'll hear a bit about Russia from Anna Svortian. Thank you, Excellencies. Thank you, everybody in this room. I'm really humbled to uh, speak here, especially as I work for an association of 153 NGOs that are coming from Russia and Europe, European Union, and all of them uh, working to expand their networks, civil societies, and work for um, strengthen people-to-people -people relations now in these times when uh, we don't really feel that uh, the borders are um, more transparent, but rather more uh, non-transparent. Why is it important to speak in Russia where I come from? Um, well, because it's the birthplace of the Stanislavsky system. And um, I'm sad I need to make this comparison um, since we've mentioned the playbook of limitations, repressions, ways to uh, curtail freedoms ways to shrink the civic space. Um, it's sad to say, but Russia can be seen as a test case for this new system. For a few years now, um, there's been a stream of repressive laws, and if I would start naming them, um, you will start nodding, many in this room, because you would immediately recognize that this is also happening in your country. You can definitely relate. Um, most recently, in 2016, Russia passed uh, legislation that is called Yaravaya Law, um, named after the parliamentarian who um, spearheaded it in the parliament, but uh, also known as Big Brother Laws, and that's, uh, that created a massive crackdown um, on uh, basic rights as expression, as uh, association as assembly, as religious freedom. Um, 
Well, why is it important? I will come with a few examples uh, so that you can relate to the situation in Russia and uh, see what else you would find in this playbook. Um, you would definitely recognize uh, terms that were coined in that book as foreign agents. That's the name for the organizations that are doing human rights and advocacy work. Undesirable organizations, well, these are most likely those philanthropy organizations, philanthropists that are supporting various movements for change and, well, simply communities that want good for themselves. Um, all of those coins, all of those names are coming from pieces of legislation um, that was tested in Russia and it works efficiently. Efficiently, which unfortunately doesn't mean good for our societies. A few examples. They might seem paradoxical, they might seem, um, you know, a little weird, I mean, a little absurd. When uh, someone who is giving a lecture about yoga is being arrested for illegal missionary work, well, he is later being released. And you would say, well, this is strange. Well, that's one of a kind, that's just one example. But, well, later this year, what we've seen just a few days ago is that Jehovah Witnesses, this movement is being banned. Um, the religious denomination that has 170,000 supporters in Russia is uh, denounced as an extremist organization. So being put on the same playing as um, Islamic State. That might be also recognizable for some of you. Um, I will talk, you mentioned a few other cases and lack of efficient, effective investigation of murder of an oppositional leader, Boris Nemtsov, that happened more than a year ago. We know nothing about the perpetrators at the moment, and I believe many of you can relate to those cases. I would mention um, Ildar Dadin, an activist who was jailed for more than two years for coming on a single man protest three times repeatedly, because this is what now Russian, uh, Russian, legislation, <coughs> Russian legislation stipulates. So he was jailed, he was subject to torture, while being in a penal colony. I would mention Valentina Cherivatenko, uh, who works for the Women of the Don Association of Women Peacekeepers and Peacemakers in the south of Russia, who is being criminally persecuted for doing what she's been always doing, preventing wars. She used to be working a lot in the North Caucasus. She's working now on the war in Ukraine and trying to uh, think about peace, and uh, this work has been largely unpopular. So Valentina and her organization are under threat. She is the first one um, to be criminally persecuted, again, under the law of foreign agents. So it all comes into a strange circle. Why I'm talking about it, um, it's not new that the states are doing these things, that uh, states are going um, on the path of um, repressive policies. You can definitely relate to that. I'm talking about it because, well, our societies are also adjusting to those policies and are becoming silent. You wouldn't see many news about all of those cases in the Russian media. You would see news about them only in a small segment online. And, of course, what you would also see in Russia is bloggers being criminally persecuted. So we are letting these things happen. Uh, it's not just the states that are shrinking that space for civic freedoms, we're also shrinking them by becoming silent, by uh, ignoring those cases. Uh, we're shrinking each other's space for freedom to speak out. And this is what I think is a big um, change in our societies, and nobody's immune to it. Uh, I started with a playbook just because these scenarios, they will be used and are being used, not just in Russia, not just in post-Soviet space. Well, now you would see some of them 
uh, unfolding in the European Union. You might recognize that they're unfolding in your own country. Um, so it's important to recognize them, and it's important to think how we can counteract. And it's very important not to be silent about them, and not to be ignorant about them. So why is it important to speak about Russia? Also because, what, despite all the legislation, despite all of those trends, I see amazing resilience in uh, colleagues working in human rights and social organizations. Um, they are de definitely in a very difficult situation, but they keep going and they look for new scenarios for innovations, how to serve their constituencies in these situations. And it's important to uh, also look and think about those strategies. So um, we know that Russia is also an amazing example of some of the movements that nobody believed in, a dissident movement, I mean, um, that uh, definitely felt totally hopeless and were just supported by very few, but eventually led to a big change. So uh, that's why I decided I need to speak about my own country and the situation. And I would stop here saying that um, activists really call for safe spaces now. So if you feel that you can provide those safe spaces, this is what is important. And safe space is definitely what we've been provided by the Carter Center at this conference. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anna. Um, now we will hear about Bahrain from Mariam al Hawada. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, actually, I wanted to maybe not talk specifically about Bahrain, but more about the international scenario for human rights and human rights work right now. But let me first begin, like many of my colleagues, and say that I'm very honored and humbled to be in the presence of so many great human rights defenders who have dedicated their lives and their time to the struggle, not the project. Um, when, we're taught, when we're looking at what's happening right now in 2017, I think there's general agreement that we're in regression when we're talking about human rights issues. Um, you know, we, when we saw the revolutions of dignity in 2011, there was a lot of excitement about human rights, human rights work, and human rights defenders. And there was a lot of celebration also around the work of human rights defenders. And it became, in a sense, even easier to approach different governments and diplomats and ambassadors to talk about the different situations that were occurring, to talk about the importance of human rights. And those doors were, to some extent, open. It might not have affected foreign policy the way we would have liked to see, but those conversations were happening. Now in 2017, I would say that instead of looking at the progress that has been made um, and trying to build on that, we're actually struggling to hold on to the things we've already achieved. And so we're trying to make sure that we're not losing some of the rights that we've already fought for so hard for over such a long time. And I think, you know, generally when we're looking at the terms of deterioration when it comes to um, repression, we see how governments around the world are doing such a good job of working together. These days, in the name of anti-extremism, anti-radicalization, anti-terrorism, governments are standing strong together. We're seeing Western countries becoming even more supportive of oppressive regimes like Egypt, like Bahrain, like Saudi Arabia, in the name of fighting radicalization and extremism. And you know, it was already mentioned uh, earlier, Brian mentioned it in, his statement, in the statement, that that's actually like shooting yourself in the foot because when you're shutting down civil society space, when you lo no longer have human rights defenders who are able to carry out their work, you see a rise in, anti in radicalization and extremism. It's when human rights defenders who are on the front line of fighting radicalization and extremism are able to carry out their work that you actually see a correlation in the drop of radicalization and extremism and less of a need for people to resort to violence to create or to bring about social and political change. And we've seen many different tools of repression that are being used. In you know, the Middle East and North Africa, in Egypt, in Bahrain, Saudi Arabia, the UAE, and so on, there's no civil space left. It's been completely shut down. Where there was limited civil space, there's none left. There's no more space for free expression. There's no more space for freedom of assembly and association. That's all gone. And we're seeing the situation deteriorate further. Um, 
And so I think that, you know, generally when we're talking about the issue of where we're headed right now, a big part of that conversation needs to be about discourse and rhetoric. It needs to be about us shifting the discourse from being about anti-radicalization, extremism, and terrorism, and talking about how promoting human rights, supporting civil society, is actually the best way to create stable countries. Countries where there's less radicalization and extremism. People turn to violence when there is no, um, no access to peaceful resolutions, to peaceful tools of resistance. That's when people feel the need to resort to violence. And so instead of understanding the problem, a lot of the governments are now dealing with the symptoms. And actually in dealing with the symptoms, they're making the problem worse. But I think also, you know, on the issue of uh, deterioration, the issue of access, you know, as some of my colleagues have already mentioned, we're seeing less and less access to different spaces, which sometimes, in essence, were supposed to foster human rights dialogue and discussions. You know, I was at the CSW, the Committee on the Status of Women in New York, a few months ago, and so many of our colleagues were not able to attend because of visa issues, because of the travel bans. And so we're reaching a point where even the very few who had access are losing that access, are becoming even more limited in being able to deliver their issues and their voices on what's going on in the world. But we've also seen people persevere. And we've also seen a lot of resistance. You know, I think I do most of my work in Western countries. And one of the things that has bothered me a lot has been, you know, this rhetoric and discourse of saving. Saving the people of the Middle East. Saving the women of the Middle East. The people don't need saving. Some of the strongest, the most resilient human rights defenders and women human rights defenders that I have ever met were in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. And they don't need saving. What they need is solidarity. Mm -hmm. What they need is support. And I think that discourse and that rhetoric also needs to be changed because it's disempowering. Mm -hmm. And it takes away the power and the strength that these human rights defenders have held and that they have grown within and with in all of these years, so many people have shown that despite the torture, despite the arbitrary arrest, this, despite the extrajudicial killings, they have been able to continue the struggle, to continue taking to the streets, to continue peacefully protesting and speaking truth to power. And those are definitely not people who need saving. I think, you know, and I'm going to end with this, when we're talking about the different roles that we can all play. One of the discussions that I think has been happening a lot lately, especially on social media, is the issue of privilege. When we talk about those of us who have privilege, and privilege comes on different levels. As a Bahraini who lives in Denmark, I have privilege. As someone who lives in Western countries, if you're of a certain color, you have more privilege than others. And with that privilege comes responsibility. The more privilege you have, the more responsibility you have to do, th to do something about injustice. And I think that we all need to recognize our privileges, whatever it is, whatever amount of it, it is that we have, and to use that privilege in helping others, because that's where it counts, that's where it matters. And so to, to end with this, you know, the issue I think at hand is accountability. If we want to see the situation moving forward, we need international accountability. The United Nations, unfortunately, today, we've seen example upon example where it has not worked in the favor of human rights. When Saudi Arabia can remove itself from a list that they were put on by the Secretary General for violations against children, then it doesn't work. Then there's something wrong. Then there's something that needs to be fixed. And I think that's part of what we need to focus on. How do we take the tools and the mechanisms that we already have that are supposed to be serving human rights and that are not completely functioning. They function in some ways and not in others. How do we strengthen those? And how do we work collectively? Our governments do such a great job of learning from each other and working together against us. So how do we work together? And how do we learn from each other collectively in our struggles, because we are struggling in the same fight, and collectively learn, to learn from each other and change things for the better? Thank you. That is great. Thank you very much. Thank you for reminding us of what we need to be doing. Too. Melissa, Melissa, can I, I don't know, um, Mariam didn't mention it, but President Carter has written to the leader of Bahrain twice 
about her father who is serving a life sentence right now. Um, and uh, so we are very aware of you didn't mention it, so because you care more about other people than yourself, but uh, I just wanted the, wor the, the room to know that. That's right, you're not giving up. Um, and so, um, as Mariam said, uh, or referenced, there are many of you in this room that uh, can remind all of us here uh, who, who have some privilege how we can be supportive and how we can be helpful um, of what you are already doing and facing. Um, and some of you, uh, we have already uh, asked if you could say a little bit about some of the, draw out some of the differences in, um, in your situations and how they may reflect what we've been seeing more globally. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, I'm really humbled by the res resilience of colleagues sitting in this room, and I'm also quite sad that uh, Hungary is, uh, is an example right now. Um, I want to speak about uh, the way in which words lose their meaning. Uh, and there are at least two ways in which words has lost their meaning. Um, the EU, uh, Hungary is part of the European Union. The European Union is built on, on core values like rule of law, democracy, respect for human rights. It was established uh, after the Second World War to avoid a similar st uh, tragedy. But when um, member states such as Hungary disrespect so fundamentally these core values and the European Union is, uh, is silent about that or just engages in, in the legal nitty-gritty of uh, certain laws and certain implications, then I, I think it has a really important implication, not only for the European Union, but the whole world. So when the words like rule of law and democracy and respect for human rights fall victim to relativization, then, then we have a real, real problem. And another way in which words are losing meaning is that uh, we used to use uh, unprecedented uh, in our press statements, and uh, now we are experiencing that every day, every week, there is a new law, and we keep saying that, oh, this is a completely different new era. We haven't lived through this. But these words are also losing their meaning. Um, and I want to illustrate this with a couple of stories from Hungary. Uh, but before going into that, I want to speak about the government that uh, that the main uh, goal of the government, of course, is to remain in power, and they have, it find a really powerful tool to do that, and it's constantly finding an enemy to fight against and show that Hungary, uh, the government, is under attack, so the people need the government to protect them. Uh, it started with a... Uh, with a story in, in 2012, when in a small smart settlement uh, in rural Hungary, uh, the far-right military group started to patrol uh, and, uh, and actually follow children to school, enter private homes of uh, Roma families, and the Hungarian government remained silent. And that really started a very strong and very, um, very sad decline. And the lack of condemnation continues until today. Uh, and actually, it's not only that, but the government took over, the governing party took over the rhetorics of the far right. So we keep saying now that uh, actually the governing party is now the new far right. It's not anymore uh, Jobbik, it's a, 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 the far right party that we used to call it. Uh, and this, is, this can be really understood through the way of um, um, how the government responded to the migration crisis. Uh, in 2015, uh, when, the, when the crisis started, well, when the crisis started to be felt in Europe, to be fair, uh, the government, I, I'm sure they were very happy because they found the perfect enemy. The perfect enemy because uh, migrants who were coming to Hungary, refugees, they were voiceless, but they could be portrayed as the, the others. As, as those that we have to fear, as, as those who are taking away the social benefits of the people who are actually suffering and living in poverty because of the lack of action by the government. So the, the politics 
is built on this, the, the fear of migration and the fear that migrants will take away that little that Hungarians still have. Hungary has 10 million uh, uh, inhabitants and 4 million live under the poverty line. So it started with hateful messages, um, uh, very mild ones, saying that if you come to Hungary, you have to respect our laws. Of course, these were written in, in Hungarian, but then, uh, in a in, in couple of months, it, uh, it really escalated. So it says, uh, other billboards say that since the migration crisis, 300 people died due to terrorism in Europe, or the Paris attacks were committed by migrants. So it's, it became part of the narrative, not only uh, in the gov uh, by the government, not only the narrative of the government, but the whole country, because billboards, TV advertisement, radio advertisement, they just send these messages out, uh, what, what we like to call it the one minute of hatred uh, from, from the novel of Orwell. And uh, this results in violence. Violence, um, and violence that incites no condemnation. So there's violence committed by the state, by various uh, police, uh, police forces and also border patrols who are uh, actually reportedly beating up refugees arriving to the Hungarian borders. The Doctor Without Borders reported that in one year they treated 106 patients with uh, dog bites and, and similar other, other uh, injuries who, which were inflicted uh, by Hungarian state authorities. But also, uh, it results in violence inflicted by the state. So private people, vigilantes and, and other people, they feel encouraged to go out there and beat migrants. And this is also happening. So, Actually, a mayor uh, nearby the border of Hungary and S uh, Serbia uh, organized people to go out there and beat migrants and post those pictures on, on social media proudly. And this is not only happening uh, to the other anymore. This is uh, this hatred, the incitement of hatred is also happening against Hungarians with dissenting voice. So uh, the crackdown on NGO started in 2013 uh, with claiming that uh, we are political activists who are serving f uh, 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 foreign interests. And that was 13. And in just uh, two years or three years, we arrived to the stage when in the beginning of uh, 2017, the vice president of the governing party said that these organizations need to be swept out of the country. Um, and the Trump presidency is clearly pictured as an opportunity by the government for doing this. So the NGO bill was uh, submitted uh, to the parliament in April and it's modeled after the, uh, the Russian foreign agent uh, law. I won't go into details about it, but what I want to say that uh, there, uh, there, was, there was of course a complete lack of consultation and a couple of our colleagues um, wanted to attend a parliamentary committee uh, to voice their, to, to speak about their accounts there to the committee, but they were refused to attend uh, due to lack of space. But anyways, an, another, an opposition uh, politician took them inside and uh, when they were refused uh, to take the floor, then they stood up uh, hold up signs saying that we demand a say and uh, they were wearing t-shirts with this, uh, with this uh, symbol and it says civil which refers to civil society and it's in a heart. Uh, so very violent and uh, controversial, right? Uh, and just last night what happened is that uh, a journalist who is a pro-government journalist who received state honors just last year uh, went on a rant on a radio and started to say that uh, these colleagues, two of, two of them working for my organization, uh, they need to be dragged out in their blood from the parliament and because they don't belong to the parliament, they belong to the public toilet. And this is, again, unprecedented, but uh, the words are losing really their meaning. Uh, but I want to, what I want to say that these can really result in violence, which they did last week when a journalist 
uh, was dragged down uh, on the stairs and uh, her camera confiscated. And, but I want to leave you with the silver lining. And when speaking about words uh, losing their meaning, there is a way to reclaim those words, because we need to reclaim those words. And what we see in Hungary working is humor. So we really just uh, address these really ridiculous and horrendous violent statements with humor. And, and the, the words really lose their meaning, so that allows us to fill them with their real meaning. Great, thank you very much. Um, so let's see, Hafsat, did you want to speak? Thank I you so too. much, Karen. I'm actually supposed to speak tomorrow but I leave tonight because I have to get to Lagos tomorrow and leave for Japan on Wednesday. So um, I asked for the opportunity to speak now. I wanted to reflect on three concepts, on fear, on solidarity, and on hope. President Carter, you probably do not remember me. It's been maybe 20 years since um, I last saw you, and um, I always looked for the time that I would be able to see you again and to say thank you. President Carter, you did well. You did really well. When we were fighting for democracy in Nigeria in 93, I don't know if you remember, but you stood up and you spoke. You defended us. You even um, hired Professor Richard Joseph to run a campaign for, for Nigeria from the Carter Center. And you worked with us for five years. In 1999, when we got our democracy, you even came to monitor elections. You've stood with us for so long. And I wanted to thank you because um, Things been what they were. I thought, you know, since my father won that election in 93, by the time that we would have a democracy, we could honor you properly. We could honor not just you, but there were so many African American pastors. There was the ACLU, there was the um, A. Philip Randolph um, Union, there were so many actors, Amnesty International, Greenpeace who stood with us, and we wanted to say thank you. But what we ended up with was a hollow form, not what we had been fighting for. And for many decades after the democracy was restored in Nigeria, we've been working to get it to even look even a little bit like what we fought for. I'm happy to tell you today that it looks more authentic I wouldn't say that the struggle, we have come to a place where we can rest, but we are seeing finally governments that are responding. Our governments are fighting the corruption that has so destroyed Nigeria with everything. We're finding billions of naira, hundreds of millions of dollars, even billions of dollars that have been stolen away from Nigeria, kept in the US, kept in Switzerland, kept in France, kept in England. The current, the current gov government has been finding these monies and bringing them back home to serve our people. You, your stand with us, began that process. When I think of fear, I think of my friend Jean N, who is here. She has this idea that there are three kinds of fear. She says you can fear the unknown, you can fear being unworthy, and you can fear being alone. And she said to me, Hafsa, which one do you fear? And I said, I don't think I fear any of them. But when I think more, I think, no, I do fear some of it. You know, I'm supposed to be nominally Muslim, but my spiritual thinking is very African philosophy. And the African philosophy says, when you die, you go to the ancestral place. 
your spirit goes to the permanent home where all your ancestors are. And my fear is that I will die and my spirit will leave the body and my ancestors won't know me. They'll say, who is that? And nobody will claim me. So certainly I fear being unworthy. I fear, you know, I fear the unknown. And I also fear being alone. But when I heard that you were ill two years ago, I think it was, I cried and I prayed. But I wasn't even afraid for you. It never occurred to me that you would, I, just, I said, even if the worst were to happen and you would leave us, I felt that your, your spirit would be shining so brightly. Not even just your ancestors, but my own ancestors, my parents who died because of the struggle, they would come and claim you. And they would lead you to where you are supposed to be. And they will sing for you every step. You would never have been alone, in, even in that. But I thank God that because of, he has a great plan, you are not going anywhere yet. And I think, I'm sorry to say, you know, I know of the love story between you and your beautiful wife, but I think you're not going anywhere because he still has work that you, he needs you to do and only you can do it. And when I think, what can that work be? I think, well, you're 92 years old. In Africa, it's almost like you are already among angels to be 92 years old. When you even walked in today and I saw that white hair, it was like a halo. And if you are among Africans to be this old, whatever you say, you would see us, all of us, just looking at you with love and reverence and we would listen keenly. Your power has never been greater than it is today. I think that America has been great, then I think America has also been too small. It has been playing too small a game. The Prophet of Islam, peace be upon him, says in one of the um, sayings that he left with us, that we should think of the world as a ship and there are two decks. And on the lower deck are many people, on the upper deck just a few. And the people on the upper deck have everything they need to be comfortable. And the people on the lower deck are hungry. Indeed, they're even thirsty. And he said, this ship is sailing in the sea. And the people are thirsty and they're trying to get the attention of the people on the upper deck. But those ones are so happy to have so much, they don't even pay attention, they don't listen. They're just happy in their happy world and they can't hear the other, the peop the other people crying at them. And the prophet said in the end that when he ended the saying, he said, then the people in the lower deck thought, let us take this ax and make a hole so we can get some water to drink. What is the saying? What is the lesson in this saying? That if they make that hole, that ship will sink. When I look at Boko Haram, indeed, when I look at the far right with their very destructive ideas, I think of the people on the lower deck. And I think of the recent push in England to, um, to leave um, the EU. The recent push, even in your own country, around the person that need not be named. And I think that, well, it was about time that America just came to the same deck as the rest of us. And if we're all on the same deck, then we can move together. The Native Americans say, if you've come because you want to help me, then you should be on your way. But if you've come because you know that your salvation is intertwined with mine, then let us walk together. <laughs> and I think that um, America is finally joining the rest of the planet. We're now in the same world. You now understand that you're human, you're not superhuman, and we still love you. And we think that together we can be truly a great world. Why have just one great country when we can all be great together? 
And this is the opportunity that you have, President Carter, to call on other leaders to fashion a new pledge for humanity, for, the, for all of mankind. This is what perhaps you are waiting to do. So if you want, you could do it in eight years. You could do it slowly. You could do it in installments. You know, because I know you, know you don't want to do it and then you leave Rosalind behind because I think both of you will probably be leaving on the same day. But you, you can do it however you like. And the gift for all of us is that we get to be with you while you do it. But I do think that we need to come up with a way to make the world as big as it needs to be. The last thing I want to say about hope is Maya Angelou. Maya Angelou said, people do what they know. When they know better, they do better. So I'm from a country where if you give me $20 million for, to help build hospitals, to build schools, I'll build a mansion for myself in Atlanta, in, in London, but nothing for the poor. But I did manage $20 million for the MDGs as a member of cabinet in Ogun State in Nigeria. And when I saw that federal, the federal government had sent me a budget that said I should sink 60 boreholes for poor children in schools across my state with money that could do 140 boreholes, I went to the governor of my state, my boss, and I said, Your Excellency, this is the budget that we have. We had something like 130 million naira. And I said, Federal has said we should sink 60 balls, but Your Excellency, we can do 140 balls. And my boss looked at me, a gentle man, a spirited being, and he said, Then have sat, let us do 140. The other day, this was three years ago, we now have a new term, he has a new cabinet of which I'm also a member again. He was telling the other members of cabinet this story, he was so proud. So I think, you know, when we attack these political leaders and say they don't know or they're doing it badly, they're not all doing it badly. Some of them are doing it actually very well. And I think if you were to call the ones that are doing it well to sit with you, they you would honor them in a way that you cannot imagine. And you would strengthen them among their peers so that they, together, we can lift our societies because you cannot come to each of our countries lifting us. We also must be the heroes in our own story. So these are some ideas for you, President Carter. And I do have one particular request. I want you to sign this book for my boss before I leave. And I just want to say to you, on behalf of my dad, MKO Abiola, on behalf of my mom, Kudrat Abiola, both of whom paid that ultimate price, on behalf of 180 million Nigerian people who are the craziest, most incredible, dynamic people on the continent of Africa, we honor you, we recognize you, thank you. Thank you very much, Hafsat. I'm so glad that you were able to speak um, today. And so uh, we have seven minutes, so we will need to wrap up very quickly, but I wanted to try to get to um, a few other uh, folks who wanted to speak. Okay, Abir, and then uh, Amr, and then we'll go uh, from there. Jamil. Jamil. Um, but also, don't worry not. Worry not, my friends. <laughs> we will have uh, time tomorrow, plenty of time tomorrow to speak. Um, but go ahead. OK, this is working now. Um, first of all, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm honored to be here today. My name is Abir Pamuk, and I'm from Aleppo, Syria. I landed in the United States one week before the ban just in January, so I kind of nailed the visa uh, to come here. I could have not been here physically uh, if I landed after the ban was issued. 
I wanted, I felt that it's so necessary today for me as a Syrian to thank you for keeping your heart open when doors and borders are being closed to Syria, when Syria is kept outside the world. It's like we are in an exile now, especially with more countries closing their um, borders to our people. Um, I also wanted um, to do things differently because this is what our generation is known of doing. I'm 24 years old and as everybody now talking about Syria is in, in international conferences is trying to come up with decisions of how many bombs they want to drop on Syria, I wanted to use this chance to give you this flower which I stole uh, um, from upstairs to tell you that Syria is not, uh, Syria it can be roses, it's not only guns. And until today, in my country, after seven years of war, if you walk in Damascus or if you walk in Aleppo, our children will be giving you roses, not guns. And this is how we are raising our children, and this is how we plan to end this war. This war. Thank you so much, President Jimmy Carter, for keeping Syria today as a part of this peaceful um, peace conference and giving us a space, in a safe space to be here and represent um, my country. Thank you very much. Jamil, please. very hard to go after uh, colleagues and uh, fearless leaders and defenders and who are really agents of change and hope, but I uh, would like to share a few uh, comments from, from a perspective of um, uh, one of the largest and oldest uh, human rights civil liberties organization in the United States, the American Civil Liberties Union. Uh, we're, I'm also very humbled to be here and, um, and I also want to thank the Carter Center and the President for, for this for hosting us here. Uh, there's a saying that I think um, that if uh, presidents in the White House miss the opportunity to be on the right side of history, and you've done a lot of that, you've been on the right side of history, they at, at least should follow the model of President Jimmy Carter after they leave the White, uh, White House in becoming leaders for support of human rights and peace around the world. So thank you for that. Uh, I, I wanted to go back to the idea of uh, human rights as a model for uh, uh, U.S. as a model for human rights, and I think that uh, what we heard in the last two days from different people around the, the, this room, uh, from different parts of the world, that the United States unfortunately has not always been on the right side of history, and we have not kept our promises and human rights commitments especially here in the United States. And I think they already made some comments that are really important. Uh, whether it's in the history of uh, you know, racial inequality, uh, economic injustice, the treatment of women, women's rights, lack of uh, respect for women's rights, immigrants' rights, violating the human dignity of those incarcerated, and the U.S. becoming the, uh, the, one of the largest jailers of the world, and in the name of national security, violating human rights. But I think more than anything, we've heard the notion that while the United States has supported peace and human rights around the world, it has also often supported wars and fueled armed conflicts and has not been consistent and have been cherry picking how to support human rights. And it was not always uh, clear that the priority of human rights, prioritizing human rights was a top national security interest of the United States. So with that, well, while we, we, are, we have this uh, uh, grim and, and difficult time today, we have a president who uh, flouts the Constitution and undermines basic human rights, challenging the legitimacy of judges and the 
he doesn't appreciate free media and the right uh, to dissent. But we are hopeful because of uh, movements like the Black Lives Matter, like indigenous-led movement uh, for water rights, land rights in Standing Rock. We are hopeful uh, because people took the streets after the, the Muslim ban and refugee ban and continue to protest. People also are protesting here in this country the expansion of mass uh, deportation and detention. But we need to be to make the case, to continue to make the case why human rights matter, turning them into a way of life and hold the powerful accountable, and not just governments, but also non-state actors, and also to emphasize the human dignity of everyone, every group and every nation and equal value, that have equal value. And in, in that regard, the ACLU role is not to be just, we are not the resistance to what we are seeing now under the new administration, but we are supporting the resistance. We are supporting people, asserting their rights, and we are going to continue to play that role in the few months and years. Finally, I would just want to take my ACLU hat off and speak as a, a Palestinian. Um, a, unfortunately, our colleagues from, from Palestinian Human Rights Organization could not make it. Some of them were invited, but they could not make it. And, uh, and would say and share with you all what they would, have up, would actually have said, particularly, uh, since, particularly since April 16. You have over 1,000 prisoners, political prisoners, on hunger strike protesting their uh, conditions of confinement, their very basic human rights in prison, solitary confinement, lack of adequate visitation, lack of medical care, unfair trials, uh, the use of administrative detention, the detention of individuals without charge or trial, including children. These things are happening and we're not hearing about them here in this country. We are only hearing about Palestinians only when we, we see the pictures of violence. And I think it's important for people to pay attention not only when, when you see the violence attached to whether the Palestinians or the Syrians or the Bahrainis or other parts of the, of the Middle East, but to see the, the human dignity of those, uh, those peoples. Uh, so I urge you to pay attention to that. And I think I would like to, to finish by uh, Gui be guided, all of us, uh, by the, I think, the most effective campaigner for human rights uh, in the history of humanity, the person who is on the, on, the, on the booklet of this conference, Frederick Douglass. And just to quote the last paragraph or last sentence, if there is no struggle, there is no progress. Power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did and it never will. Thank you very much. I think that's an excellent ending um, to this to this session. Um, we are very close to on time, um, and so I've been asked to send all of us to dinner where we can continue to discuss and move forward. Um, and dinner is in the Cyprus room, and I think that we will maybe get some instructions about where to go and how to get there. Thank you very much. <laughs>